<laughs> it is time. It is time for the good news. Let me hear you say good news. Good news. All right, we just got to get started that way. It is the second Sunday of Advent, and we are doing a four-part sermon series about what they saw. And what we mean by that is we're taking an Old Testament prophecy and then talking about how it was fulfilled with Jesus. And to get started today, I want to talk about my favorite line from a Christmas song. Now, I know it's pretty common to have a favorite Christmas song, and maybe a little weirder to have a favorite line from a Christmas song, but this line has really stuck itself into my heart and mind over the last year and shaped really my whole vision of the gospel. So let's look at our Christmas slideshow of images. When we sing Christmas songs, we usually have a beautiful starry night and a little baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and that very docile donkey just sitting there very patiently and the shepherds and the angels. And the song that this line comes from starts exactly like that, which is the Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. But the line that's really stuck itself into my mind and heart comes from verse 3. And the line, you probably heard quite a bit of the theme going on in the worship today, was, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Now, I'm not going to tell you today that you've got to throw out the mental picture you have of the baby Jesus in the starry night, but I do think that I can make a case today for adding this picture of this slave in chains to the slideshow of images when you think about Christmas, because it is important to understanding what that baby meant and what that God did for us. So, to do that, we're going to go into the book of Isaiah. Now, I know Pastor Des last week gave a beautiful sermon on Isaiah, and Isaiah is great but I do feel like it should come with a warning label because it is probably one of the most challenging books of the Bible to read. It's challenging because it is a lot of poetry, and I don't know about you all, but I actually don't read a lot of poetry outside of the Bible. It's challenging because it's historical, and it hits on all these historical points, and unless you know all of the biblical history, which, by the way, most scholars don't know all of that biblical history during that time, it's pretty hard to figure out what is happening when. And it's also just incredibly convoluted. The book of Isaiah, we believe that the Holy, scripture, or the Holy Spirit put Scripture together the way it was meant to be put together. But if you're reading Isaiah and you don't understand what is going on, whose voice is talking, or what you're supposed to get out of it, let's just say that's an Isaiah problem, not a you problem. Or it's both of your problem, but... It really, you need the Holy Spirit to, to get out of Isaiah what you're going to get out of Isaiah. But the most challenging thing about the book of Isaiah is that it thrusts us into an experience of the anger and the hurt of God that makes most of us modern Christians kind of go, Ooh, that is not my God. We know that God is love. We know that God died for our sins on the cross, that God died for everyone and we have this picture of this redeeming and forgiving and loving God. And when we see God as characterized as angry and hurt in Isaiah, we tend to distance ourselves a little bit from it. But what Isaiah saw that, that we don't really like to think about is the way the things we do to each other cause God to be angry and cause God to be hurt. Now, it's Christmas, so that's not what this sermon is about. But what this sermon is about is the mission that God's anger and God's hurt set into motion. And that's what Isaiah 61 is about. Isaiah 61, what Isaiah saw was God on a mission, and what Isaiah 61 is about is the who and the what of that mission. Now, Isaiah 61 has, it's about a redeemer that's on his way. We know that in context, we're talking about somebody who is going to come that is going to rescue us. And the thing about Old Testament prophecy is it's not always clear what applies to Jesus and what doesn't apply to Jesus. Now, scholars have said, this one's about Jesus, this one's about Jesus, this one's about Jesus. But if I've learned anything in school so far, it's that we are rarely 100% sure which ones are about Jesus. But this one we can be certain about because Jesus says it's about Jesus. It's one of the only times that happens. So, great, we can go forward knowing that this is talking about Jesus. So let's look at the text. 
Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now I told you that Isaiah 61 would give us the who and the what of the mission. The who is a lot easier. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The one who is anointed will be the one who is equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit. How will we know the Redeemer when he comes? He will be the one with the Holy Spirit. Keep that fact in mind because we're going to use it all the way through the sermon. The what of the mission is a lot more complicated. So we're going to go line by line to make sure that we've got the what in our brain the first line, it says, to bring good news to the poor. The mission is to bring good news to the poor. Now, this word poor, make no mistake, absolutely includes the poor. But the Hebrew word that's being translated here can also be translated as the meek, the weak, the afflicted, and the oppressed. And that in his name, all oppression shall c- cease, right? Oppressed is the best word here because in the bigger context of Isaiah, what Isaiah is really concerned about is oppression. And oppression covers all of those, the meek, the weak, the afflicted, and the poor. So think of it as good news for the oppressed. The next line is, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, I'm not going to lie. On my first read through, I had like a mental picture of someone being bound up. And I was like, why would Jesus do that to the brokenhearted? But this is not that kind of bind up. This is bandaging. Jesus will heal the brokenhearted. He will heal the brokenness of people who are suffering under oppression. Now this next line I think is the most important one, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, during this time, during when Isaiah is giving the prophecy, Israel is literally in captivity, they're in exile. And so this has a literal interpretation that Israel's going, yes, we need this, we need this guy, he's gonna set us free. But in the broader picture of Isaiah, we see that this is not just about literal captivity, but about oppression from oppressive systems. Economic oppression of the poor by the rich, political oppression of the masses by the few, legal oppression of the captives by the captors. Isaiah hits on these over and over and over again. When we talk about set free, we don't just mean set free literally, but set free from oppression generally. And the opening, okay, so the next line, the opening of prison to those who are bound. Now, this one is incredibly confusing um, because, first of all, it seems like a mishmash of the two before it. And then, second of all, by the time Jesus gets up to read this scripture in Luke 4, this line is interpreted very differently than what we have in our Bible in the Old Testament. So I look to a really literal interpretation of this line to see how Jesus could have gotten to his translation. And this is the literal interpretation. To the, to, and two bound ones, the opening of bands. Well, what do we know about binding? It's not about this kind of binding, it's about the healing kind of binding. So imagine one of those people in like a full body cast with their full face covered in bandages, and for the first time after they've been healed, their eyes are open up to something new. The removal of the thing that had been getting in their way, they've been healed, and now they can see a new vision for the world. And that last line, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor always refers to the Jubilee, which is something from Leviticus 25, where uh, slaves would be set free, all land would be returned to its initial owner, and all debts would be forgiven. This is all of the things that oppression causes, debt, slavery, the loss of land, is going to be made right by this Redeemer. So, I don't know about you, but that was a lot. Um, to take in, it's like, okay, so my mission is, so let me synthesize that mission down for you so that you can actually understand the Isaiah 61 what of the mission. The mission is that the Redeemer will set the oppressed free from oppression. The Redeemer will heal those who are suffering under oppression, and the Redeemer will cast a new vision for a new reality where everything is made right. In his name, all oppression shall cease. That is the mission that Isaiah said the Redeemer would do. That is Isaiah's vision of the mission, and that is exactly the mission that Jesus claimed. Because now we fast forward to Luke 4, and we've, Luke, uh, 
Jesus has been baptized. The Holy Spirit has descended upon him. The Holy Spirit has led him into the wilderness. In the wilderness, he resisted the temptation of the devil, and the Holy Spirit leads him to Galilee. And he ends up in Nazareth in his really first major act of ministry in Luke. This is what happens. This is Luke 4, 16 to 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So who is the who of the mission? Well, if you believe Jesus, it's Jesus. And even if you were trying to convince somebody who wasn't a Christian that it was Jesus, you would look to Isaiah 61. Who is the one that the prophecy is about? The one who is equipped and empowered with the Holy Spirit. So we know the who of the mission. And then there's the what of the mission. What did Jesus do? Did he set free the oppressed? Did he heal the hurting? Did he preach a vision of a new reality where everything would be made right? Yes. And as I prepared for this sermon, I thought, ah, I'm going to go into scripture, and I'm going to find all the places he set people free, and I'm going to find all the places he healed people, and I'm going to talk about all of the things that he said about the new vision of the new reality where everything is made right. But the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, nah, just go back to Luke 4. Okay, because Luke 4 has this claiming of this mission as his own, and it has three more major stories. And in my Bible, which is an ESV, which is what you guys have, it has three headings. Their three stories are a person set free from demonic possession, the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, and the fact that Jesus went to preach the good news of the kingdom of God for, and this is his own words, I was sent for this purpose. So in one chapter, we have the mission being claimed and then the mission being worked out. You don't even have to do the work. It's all through the gospel. If you really wanted to do what my original plan was, you could, but you don't even have to because it's all there in Luke 4. So to recap, we have Isaiah who saw the mission, Jesus who claimed the mission. That's the who and the what. But what I really want to talk about today is the how. Because we actually have more information than Isaiah. We have now seen Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We know how it went down. And so here's my question for you. Does Jesus set people free with his life or with his death and resurrection? Because if you asked Isaiah, the people at Isaiah's time, what they wanted, they wanted somebody who was going to set them free free with his life, that they would come there, that they would get to go back to their home, that they would no longer be living in captivity. And when we're in Sunday school, we teach the kids, oh, silly Israel. They were expecting a political savior, and God sent a spiritual savior. But any modern Christian is going to say, oh, we are absolutely set free by Jesus' death and resurrection. It frees us from the power of sin. It frees us from the power of death. It makes it so that we can be transformed, so that we can transform the world. And I think Jesus is somewhere in the middle going, it was both, right? Jesus saved people from the power of sin and death with his death and resurrection. But Jesus also saved people, set them free, healed them, and spoke a new vision with his life in ministry. In his life, Jesus disrupted oppression with compassion. What do I mean? Well, he disrupted religious oppression when he healed the man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath. He disrupted gender-based and legal oppression when he stopped the stoning of the adulterous woman. Jesus stopped economic oppression when he cleansed the temple. And it wasn't just the setting free from oppression with his life. He also healed people during his life. Not one time did somebody come to Jesus needing something I'm lame, I'm blind, I'm in pain. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, but you're going to have to wait until death to be set free from your pain. That is not how Jesus rolled. Okay, so we know that Jesus did things with his life. But why does that even matter? 
why does it matter so much that it was his life and his death and resurrection? We just jump straight to death and resurrection. But here's why it matters. Because if we're going to really know our God, if we're going to really know what Jesus is about, we need to understand that we serve and worship a God who cares about human suffering. It is good news that we serve a God who sees the least. It is good news that we serve a God who is against oppression. It's a good news that we serve a God who is angry on our behalf, who is hurt when we hurt, because it is good news that we serve a good God. That matters. But it matters for another reason. Because Old Testament prophecy does not work like the prophecy of fantasy books. In a fantasy book, there is a person who the prophecy is about, an event that will happen, and once that person and that event has happened, the prophecy is fulfilled. But Old Testament prophecy speaks again and again and again to each new generation. And what that means is that Isaiah 61 still has legs. But who is the one that Isaiah 61 is about in 2022? The who of Isaiah 61. The one who is empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit. And who do we know that is empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit? Y'all, right? It's about us. We are now called into that mission, that mission that Isaiah saw, the one that Jesus claimed, and now he gives to us to, yes, proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it can do for people spiritually, but also with our life to set people free from, free from oppression with our compassion. So we're going to read that uh, prophecy one more time, and I would like you guys to say it with me, knowing that it is your mission that you are claiming. So here we go. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. And what will you do to bring good news to the poor? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. How will you do it? Should you? with your life, empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit, proclaim to everyone who will listen the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it has the power to transform people and transform the world? Yes. Yes, you absolutely should. But should you also, with your life, disrupt oppression with your compassion, bring healing to those who need it, and show a new kind of world where things can be made right. Also, yes, that's what Jesus did. That is the mission that he is calling you to. It is not only about the death, but also about his life and what you will do with your life. So now I know what you're thinking. I've never really thought of myself as a chain breaker before. Um, what does this mean for my life? Does this mean that I'm going to have to join a political party? or um, get up and protest, or stop buying every single Christmas present that you bought this year from Amazon? Maybe. But if you look to Luke 4, what you'll see is that the Holy Spirit was always moving Jesus where Jesus needed to be, right? The Holy Spirit placed Jesus and led Jesus to the place that Jesus needed to be to do his ministry. And the chances are you are placed in the place that you need to be a chain breaker, where you can disrupt oppression with your compassion. If you're one of those people that serves at the food closet or at St. John's on a regular basis, you are disrupting oppression with your compassion. If you are a school teacher that advocates for the needs of special needs kids and makes sure that they have what they need to learn, you are disrupting oppression with your compassion. If you are a business owner, that is making sure that even your lowest level worker is getting paid a living wage, you are disrupting oppression with your compassion. If you are a grandma or an auntie or an adopted neighbor that invites people into your home and feeds them casseroles and enchiladas and invites kids to have a warm and cozy and loving afternoon with you, you are disrupting oppression with your compassion. 
when you stand up against injustice and bigotry in this world, you are disrupting oppression with your compassion. Make no mistake, you are equipped, you are empowered, and you are placed by the Holy Spirit where you need to be to do this work in this life, the mission that God is calling you to do while we are here. So if we go back to that slideshow of images, and I see that baby on that starry night with that mom and that dad, and I think that is a beautiful picture. And it's even more beautiful when I realize that that baby will grow up and save the world with his death. But I also now have an even fuller picture of what that baby will become. Somebody who grows up to live a life of ministry where he doesn't say no to somebody who is hurting. He doesn't allow oppression to continue, but disrupts it through acts of compassion. And he calls us, he calls me into that mission with him. And I'm thankful that that picture got even more beautiful today because my picture of God got even more full. And I want to pray over you as we go back into the world about the mission that you are now called to do, the mission that you can see, and the work of the Holy Spirit in you on that mission. So let us pray. Holy Spirit, you have placed us and you have equipped us and you have empowered us and we ask for more power and more equipping. And we ask, Lord, that in the places that you have put us that we see where you are, what you would like us to do, what are you calling us to do, and the ways that we can disrupt oppression with our compassion, the ways we can bring healing and cast a new vision for a new reality where everything is made right. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.